Um, most of you were here this morning. I think there's only a few people uh, who uh, have joined us later. Uh, we've heard a lot about adults and what happens at the elite level, and I think it's fantastic that the GA has taken such an interest in everybody from the smallest player to the biggest, most important player. Uh, these are, well, there's quite a few pictures of my children in this talk. <laughs> this little one isn't, but this little one is, and you'll see her again later. These are the next Rena Buckleys, or maybe they're not. Maybe they'll just play Camogie for a little while and then give up. But the important thing is that they're out there, they're fit, they're enjoying sport, they're getting exercise. Um, it's, it's helping them, it's uh, helping their development, it's helping their social skills, it's so important. The GAA is at, in every parish, it has access to so many communities, and this is a fantastic opportunity for the GAA to really engage with the community and educate them about concussion, and it doesn't have to be in a match, it can be anywhere, but once you recognise a concussion, you've taken the first step in helping your child to recover. So I did this doodle <laughs> the other day because I'm going to tell you about how badly we're designed as computers, because if you were designing a supercomputer like our brain is, uh, you wouldn't design it like this. You wouldn't put the actual computer into a box with loads of space around it with a high centre of gravity and a wobbly stem and bumpy ground. That's just ridiculous. But that's how we're designed. So I don't know if any of you watch SpongeBob, but Plankton's wife is called Karen, and she looks a bit like us, really. Um, I've spoken a few times about uh, the design flaws in children. This is a two-year-old child. See how huge their head is in proportion to their body. And then as you get older, your body catches up with your head. But our head actually stays pretty much a similar size from about the age of two. So you have this big head on a little body. This is my daughter, Elsie, who you saw earlier. Where the head goes, the body follows. <laughs> they also do ridiculous, unpredictable things. Now, that could have ended in disaster, but it didn't. It was just funny. Um, this is a, is a concussion-proof human. His name is Graham. And uh, he was designed by an Australian trauma surgeon and an artist. And they, they got together and they said, what would a human look like if they were designed to, to survive a road traffic accident? And it's a similar sort of, obviously, the impacts are not the same in, in uh, concussion, but it's a similar sort of a theory. So the way he's designed, he has airbags in his ribs. He has um, ribs that go all the way up his neck, so his neck can't wobble around. And he has his brain encased in this huge cranium and very well supported with basically airbags all around it as well. And I started thinking about Graham, and I started to wonder maybe if rugby had been involved in some genetic modification, <laughs> uh, because he looks a little bit like a rugby player. Um, now, I uh, worked in the developing world as well. I worked with, uh, with UNICEF um, in Nepal. And there are a lot worse things that can happen to you as a child than concussion. So we must remember that children all over the world are dying of malnutrition, of measles, of pneumonia. In the global context, concussion is a pretty small problem. But when it visits your own home, it's a big problem. This is Elsie again. She's a little bit accident prone, God love her. She fell off a pony. Um, uh, that's her helmet, that's a big crack in her helmet. I'd rather that crack was in her helmet than in her skull. That's why helmets are so important, but there's no such thing as a concussion-proof helmet. So, unfortunately for Elsie, she broke her arm as well in this accident, and we were all focused on the arm. But three weeks later, her arm was still a problem, but her main problem was she was as cranky as hell, and she was complaining of headaches. This is a year ago now. And finally, me, the pediatric neurologist, finally the penny dropped, Jeekers, maybe she's concussed. So if it took me that long, can you imagine what it's like for other parents trying to figure out what the hell is wrong with their child? So I'm just going to go really revisit a lot of the points that have been made today. Uh, I'm going to say what concussion is not, what it is, how does it happen, is it happening more, how is it diagnosed, and what can we do? So what it's not. It is not trivial. It is not just concussion. But it's not a disaster, and it's not permanent. So it is a mild traumatic brain injury. It is serious, but it is manageable, and it is temporary. This is a child with you concussion. You broke your collarbone. Okay. I had no idea. 
Okay. You wrecked on your bike. Okay. I knew that. I forgot my camera. Yep. I went to the hospital. Yep. And my bike's in perfect condition. Yep. It's Friday. Yep. It's okay. You're confused. Okay, now okay. I'll tell them what how paper did you just give me this? Just, just one. Okay, read it over again. You broke your collarbone. You wrecked on your bike. You forgot your camera. What did I forget my camera? So, how does it happen? <laughs> Play this in slow motion for you. Soccer. Lots of slow modes, great, <laughs> for the drama. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is it can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be uh, on a pitch. Um, kids are awful idiots sometimes. <laughs> and they do pretty horrific things, even with adults around them. So there was loads of adults there. Somebody should have had the cop on to say, like, you know, maybe you don't want to crash into the tree. And this is just a little funny one. So these are all on YouTube. These are non none of these are my children. Um, they're all on YouTube, and uh, I download them all. And, you know, if they're on YouTube, uh, essentially, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they can be used as educational tools. So I think it's very educational for us to see. First, In the first clip, you saw how confused that young fellow was. He had no clue. They had given him a piece of paper. He was reading it, and then he forgot he'd read it. He read it again. He, he, everything was news to him. Every time he read it, he was so confused. And as you can see then, children just can really do very daft things. And because their heads are big and their bodies are small and they don't have the motor control that adults have, they are much more prone to concussion. So you all, by now, I'm sure you all know how it happens. Blow to the head, your brain is rattled, you get microscopic injury and inflammation of neurons and it leads to a myriad of symptoms. You know all about those now. You're all experts on that. Is it happening more? So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics reports that the diagnosis of concussion has doubled in the last decade. Partly it's more concussions, uh, but mostly it's better recognition. And the thing that I want you all to remember is that one in three people by the age of 25 will have had a concussion. So one third of us will get concussed. And because this is a sporting arena, more than one third of us have been concussed. So how is it diagnosed? We had a lot of talk earlier about sideline assessment. It's a clinical judgment. Um, you know, when you're a practitioner for long enough and you see something happening or you see somebody and how they're behaving, you have this clinical intuition and you have to use it. Um, now, we were talking earlier about how we're going to develop this service. Um, GPs are, 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 are the backbone of our uh, health service and um, it's really important, I think, for us to uh, spread the word amongst GPs. We were educated today on how to use the VOMS. Um, I think if we were able to introduce impact baseline testing, that would be great. At present, we use the SCAT3, but there are flaws in that. It's not, um, it's not a, a great thing to diagnose certain aspects of concussion. Um, this is the pocket concussion uh, recognition tool that the GA uses at the moment, and it's based really on the SCAT3. Um, these are the sort of the Maddox questions that you can ask. These are the, the symptoms that people can complain of, and these are the red flags. I think, you know, it's really important to remember that at most matches there is no medical person present. And the GA at least has made great strides in educating the lay population, the parents and the children themselves. But uh, it's always important to have access to this list of red flags because it mightn't be concussion. It might be something else. It might, it might be a brain bleed. So, what can we do? Now, he's, he's a very handsome coach, <laughs> um, but he's, I just put that in there. Are you okay to play on? That provokes this reaction in me, okay? The concussed person, particularly the concussed child, is never in a position to make that decision. That is a decision that is made by a doctor if there's a doctor there, but it's made by the coach, the managers, the fellow players if there's nobody there. So we don't want to be um, pushy parents. Uh, like... The children feel under a lot of pressure to perform. Um, they feel under pressure from their parents, from their coaches, from their teammates. They don't want to let anyone down. We shouldn't be this mum. We shouldn't be this coach. 
and we shouldn't be this dead. Um, you know, things get very heated in matches, and I think there's been a lot of issues recently. That we, ha we have to introduce a code of conduct for parents about how they should decide, uh, behave at the sideline because they can be really pushy. Um, and, you know, so here you have an illustration of, you know, I think that's the referee, the coach, and somebody else all having a bit of an argy-bargy, but this is the person that's important. So, when I lived in Nepal, um, they have a, they're mostly Hindu, and they have a living goddess called the Kumari, and that's a young girl. And uh, she's, only, she's only a goddess as long as she has no major injuries or no major illnesses or she doesn't um, bleed. So when she comes to puberty, then she's, she's kicked out and they find a new one. Um, so we can't treat our girls or our boys like the Kumari. They have to get out there. They have to get grubby. They have to get injured because that's how we learn. Um, so we have to let kids be kids. These are my incredibly adorable children again. Um, so, you know, it happens. <laughs> they, you can't just wrap them in cotton wool. This is poor old Elsie. I, my heart is always in my mouth whenever she does anything faster than a walk at this stage. And you have to let them get back in the saddle, okay? So, but at the same time, you have to be cautious. Um, that's Mick's granddaughter there, actually, Mick, <laughs> the audience. That's your granddaughter hanging upside down next to my daughter. Um, so, uh, but... So let kids be kids, but be the responsible person and never be afraid to, to speak out if you are worried, if you suspect that your child is concussed, intervene um, and do what you feel is right for your child. So the future then, obviously my, my thing is to raise awareness of concussion in children, but I think today's symposium has succeeded in where, uh, raising awareness of concussion in general. I think it would be a great thing if we had baseline testing of all children, particularly if the GAA was able to offer that as a sort of a, you know, sort of the part of being a member of the GAA. Early diagnosis equals early recovery. And my job, what I want to do, is to develop a dedicated concussion service for children. Uh, so my children have a lot of Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, if there are questions. I don't know that there will be though, you're all wrecked. Um, I think uh, some of the videos uh, that you had there of the kids falling around the place, uh, acting the Egypt, did that, uh, how important is it to see the actual incident that, uh, that might have caused the concussion? Or, um, yeah. you know, if you don't know what the incident was, is it uh, very tough to diagnose a concussion just from the symptoms? Not really, if you know what you're looking for. Um, so, yeah, it always helps to have video footage, but, mo you know, most of the time it's not caught on video. Um, and so generally what you'd say as a parent, um, like I said, it took three weeks for me for the penny to drop. Uh, and I'm a trained neurologist, you know, so go figure, but so obviously I've educated myself since then, but um, yeah, it's, it's about irritability, it's about change in personality, it's about headaches, it's about concentration problems, it's about exhaustion, it's all of the things that we've heard about today, and now you know that, and you'll be able to tell your friends that, and you'll be able to apply that to your own family. Um, but if you don't know, like I see a lot of children where they're, they're brought into me and the parents say, this child has headaches and irritability and poor concentration. And uh, we go back and back and back. And eventually the conclusion has to be drawn that maybe it's a concussion. And something like the impact tool that they have in UP UPMC, you can actually use that in that situation if you suspect it, because it might actually reveal that the child is in fact concussed. And what would be even more useful is if you had baseline data on that child so that you could compare. Eve, I'm just wondering what the criteria are to refer to your clinic. I mean, uh, so, like I said, the GP is so important uh, in the whole management of concussion. And 
generally, I suppose what I'm trying, the model that I'm trying to build, and Mick obviously has, he can speak about this later as well, because Mick also has a concussion clinic, uh, is that um, generally most children uh, will get better by themselves. You know, they, they're very good, they want to be active, they're very good at rehabilitating themselves. So generally after about two weeks, the symptoms should be gone. Um, but if you go back, if you bring your child back to the GP and the child is still symptomatic, then they may be in that small cohort of children who actually aren't going to recover by themselves. So what I would say is that it's, it's a child that's not recovering really after about two or three weeks. Yeah. And do you take, sorry, do you take referrals from all over Ireland or? Uh, probably now, yeah. <laughs> um, it's just important to mention also that our physiotherapists, we have three physiotherapists who are now, who now trained in the UPMC technique, and that's, that's, a, that's a work in progress. So I, I'm, ba I'm pretty much useless, really. I can say, yeah, you're concussed, but I'm not the person who's going to be ta rehabilitating them. That's the physiotherapist's job. Okay, we're done? Yeah, yeah thanks.